Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Welcome to this, the 21st meeting in 2015 of the Economy, Energy and Tourism Committee. Uh, can I welcome all members, our witnesses, who I'll introduce in a moment, and can I also uh, welcome visitors in the public gallery, and can I remind everyone, please, to turn off or at least turn to silent all mobile phones and other uh, electronic devices. Uh, we have apologies this morning from Patrick Harvey, who is running late, but hopes to join us uh, shortly. Uh, item uh, one on our agenda this morning, we are continuing to take evidence uh, on our inquiry into work, wages and well-being in the Scottish labour market. Uh, we have two panels to hear from. I'd like to welcome our first panel, representing the Fair Work Convention. We have Anne Douglas and Linda Urquhart. Welcome uh, to you both. Um, we are hoping to run this first panel for about an hour, and members have uh, uh, a number of different questions that they would like to ask about the work that the Convention is doing. Um, perhaps you can just sort of agree between yourselves who's best placed to answer, answer each question. And maybe you have different views, in which case we'd be delighted to hear from you if, if you don't necessarily share the same opinion. But I think what we're keen to do is focus on the work the Convention is doing and uh, try and understand uh, what conclusions you might be coming to in due course. So could I maybe just start off uh, and ask you, and, and you can maybe decide between you who wants to pick this one up uh, initially. Uh, an easy question, I think. What is fair work? I think maybe if I start and then hand over to Linda, and I'm actually pretty sure that we won't give different answers on this. Fair work is not easy to define. Um, it's a massively broad theme. There isn't one specific area that we can look at as a convention and say if we sort that, then that's fair. Um, so what we, what we are trying to do is to identify a number of themes <coughs> which themselves will have a number of subsections that will give a very broad view of what fair work in the view of the Convention is. Now these themes are things that we've started to test out with a number of stakeholders. And I think it's fair to say that so far, the stakeholders who we have already engaged with haven't disagreed with the themes that we are looking at. But I think one of the other things that's coming out is that the themes themselves are pretty cross-cutting. So that, I think, adds to the complexity rather than, than aids any simplicity in the work that, that we're doing. Linda? Yeah, I think the only thing I would add to that is that as a convention, what we're finding is that, and I think what we will find it during our work is, we've been tasked with producing a framework by next March, and I think where we will get to by then is that we will have some of the areas of fair work and our ideas of the themes evolved and defined to a greater or lesser extent. And there will be some areas where, in that timescale, we will be saying this is an area that needs further work, further research. So in arriving at our themes, we have um, academic advice from P Patricia Finlay of Strathclyde University, who I think has already given evidence to this committee. Um, and along with the engagement with the stakeholders, which we're doing... Strathclyde University and Patricia's team will be producing summaries of uh, international research on, this, on the subjects. So as well as speaking to stakeholders, the convention will have available to it research on each of the themes, uh, and that will help us in us reaching our view on what fair work is. OK, thank you. That's, that's helpful just to understand how the work is being taken forward. Can I ask you to say a little bit more about the work the Convention has done up till now in terms of you know, how many times do you meet? Have you got particular uh, subgroups who are away working uh, on different themes? We meet monthly as a full Convention. The chairs meet in addition to that with Trisha, Patricia Finlay. Um, we have used our themes, our preliminary themes, as the focal points for each of those monthly meetings. In addition to 
uh, our, those monthly meetings, we've got a group at the moment looking at our stakeholder engagement. Now, stakeholder engagement, we, there are so many people who have an interest in this agenda that we could spend all our time talking to people and that would not be practical. So we had an, an, an initial stakeholder map and we're now at the stage of thinking, well, was, were, did we have the right people on that? Who have we seen? Who have we not seen? And how do we reach the people who might not otherwise naturally be engaged with an organisation like us, but have something to say on the subject? Okay. And how are you resolving that issue? Reaching the people who might otherwise not reach us. Um, I think... Um, Two things. Firstly, we will be doing a very general call on our website um, using social media to reach people, hopefully, who might not otherwise see us, but also using some of the stakeholders. So, for example, Citizens Advice Bureau, who are often the first port of call for people who have an interest in this agenda. Thanks. Um, just one more question for me before I bring in um, Dennis Robertson. Um, one of the issues that our committee has identified so far is, is, is quite difficult to get sufficient Scottish labour market data to help inform uh, some of the work we want to do. Can I ask what, what your experience of that has been? Do you think there's enough information out there to underpin the work that's being undertaken? I, mean, I, think, there is, I think there is a problem with, with the data. I don't think there's any doubt about that. And I think from reading through some of the evidence sessions you've already had, um, particularly it's an STUC theme, something that's come up time after time, that the labour market data, because most of it UK-wide, you can extrapolate but can't be absolutely sure. And I think we're in exactly the same position. And I think that's why we're trying to reach out to people who are actually experiencing what has been going on and what is going on, whether they are employers or whether they are employees, to back up some of the some of the theories and some of the the themes that seem to be coming out. But I think we agree there is a lack of credible Scottish labour market information. Okay, okay thank you. Um, I'll bring in Dennis Robertson. Hey, thank you, Kavina, and good morning. Um, with regard to the five themes that you, you've identified. How do you see uh, overlaying those themes within the rural and remote areas of Scotland as opposed to some of the urban areas? To ensure that we've got the opportunity, access to work, uh, we've got the diversity, we've got uh, opportunity uh, for people to go into apprenticeship, um, internships, all those aspects. How do you see it applying to rural Scotland? I, I, I would just say that one, one of the things that we are charged with as a convention is to work with other public agencies, many of them who have an, in, in, have an input into opportunities within rural Scotland and different parts of Scotland. I think what the Fair Work Convention, and we haven't discussed this as a convention, but what we can't do is make everything right. I think what we hope to do is suggest ways in which things will get better. You can't make everything right, but are you attempting to make everything fair? We are going to attempt to make everything fair. My own view, and this isn't a convention view, is that fairness doesn't necessarily mean equal. It may be that to be fair, areas need to be targeted in different ways or opportunities need to be made available <coughs> to different groups of people. Yeah, and I understand that. The, the, and this is probably bringing me on to my sort of second question here. Um, and it, it really is about the diversity here. Now, wh whether or not we're, we're, I mean, obviously, we're very interested on trying to ensure that when we're trying to close this gender gap, that opportunities for women, for instance, uh, are into jobs which are deemed to be, in, in quotes, better than, than previously uh, we, we've heard. 
uh, in terms of the impact of the well-being, but opportunity for women to get into this sort of better employment with better conditions, better opportunities. And the same would apply to people from other, other groups, such as people with disabilities. How do you see the Convention applying the, the themes and the work that you're doing to address both those areas, that is the gender gap, and the pe opportunities for people with disabilities as well? So, so what I would say at this stage is there, that we are at the what stage of our deliberations. So what might fair work look like? And we've not yet got on to the how might that be implemented. So in, in terms of the, the what, how far down the line are you in terms of uh, identifying the what? And when do you think then that you'll be able to identify the how uh, in addressing the, the questions that I've just put to you? I, th I think in terms of the what, we've had already an amount of engagement with a number of different organisations and individuals. And I think we see that continuing at least until the end of October, at which time I think we will take stock and reflect on what we've heard and who we've heard from. Because to date, we have very much been in listening mode we haven't been in even analytic mode. We've been listening, we've been learning, um, but we haven't gone any further than that yet. That's fine, Kevin, I think, at the moment. I, I think basically I'm saying that's fine at the moment is because if we're still identifying the what and you're in listening mode, it, it's, it's, you're not at the stage of being able to answer the question in terms of the how we we implement this the aspect of fair work to enable uh, the the closure of the gender gap and opportunities <coughs> for people with disabilities to get into the the mar the job market in terms of better quality jobs uh, for both sectors that I've mentioned. Um, so is that something that you would you would see as uh, in listening mode that you'll be able to take away? and maybe come back to the committee um, maybe at uh, or as part of your conclusions uh, with your report in March? I would envisage that that's exactly the kind of thing that will be within the framework in March. The extent to which we will have detail on the how at that stage, um, I, don't, I think it's early for us to say, but that's what we'll be aiming to have in the framework. OK, thank you. Thank you. OK, um, Lewis McDonald. Thanks very much. Um, Clearly, the work you've described very much goes al along with the remit of this inquiry and, 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 and addresses many of the questions we're seeking to understand. One of the things uh, that, that one of the quotes that caught my eye was the proposition from the Federation of Small Businesses that what we needed to start with was a robust and accepted uh, standard uh, of uh, job quality or measure of job quality. Uh, and uh, clearly the framework is working towards that. How far do you think? It meet, it, you, how far do you anticipate being able to create a robust framework that will be uh, accept, understood and accepted by employers, employees and, 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 and other interested parties? I, don't, I, don't, I, I hope the answer to that is that I hope we are fairly successful. Um, what we are looking towards, though, I think, is a framework that is not static, <coughs> but rather a framework that is a continuum um, where fair work <coughs> excuse me, doesn't start with legal compliance, we take that as a given, um, and at the opposite end then it's an organisation who treats its employees exemplar in an exemplary fashion. But I think we are very conscious that the framework shouldn't be so prescriptive as to have employers or employees or trade unions feel that it would be impossible to achieve. So I think we see it as being something that people can aspire to and move on from. Um, we've looked, as Linda said, at some international experience, and I think it's Finland um, who has a system 
where there are a number of different categories as well as a number of different themes that organisations can move through to become better and become best practice. I'd say it's kind of top, middle, bottom, but we see bottom as being below where we want the starting point to be. So, yeah, and, and I think what we would be encouraging organisations would be to plot their current position on that matrix and look at where they might get to. And going back to, I think, the one of the outcomes we would like to see from this, which is, is its ability to support inclusive growth and competitiveness, is the idea that most of the organisations which are in the upper part of the matrix and performing well will be high-performing organisations. Yes, indeed, and, and I guess that, that, that raises a couple of, of, of further thoughts. Um, Clearly, and there's no there's no there's no simple rule about this. But clearly, if if your conclusions point to the need for improvement in uh, behaviours or structures within businesses or other organisations, some of those issues will be more readily addressed by larger organisations simply because they will have the, the capacity to, to 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 take those on. Do you do you envisage there being a, a particular agenda for smaller employers to address and do you envisage uh, consequences from that for the public sector for, or for government in particular in, in supporting changes that you uh, anticipate putting, bringing forward? So if, if, if I can pick up on that one because it's one of the things I've talked about from the moment I accepted the role mm. which is if you look at the um, landscape of the Scottish business community the majority of businesses are small medium size. And so what we have to find in our work are routes to help those organisations who won't have big HR teams, won't necessarily have the resources, to find practical ways to improve on their own fair work agenda. Now, quite what that looks like at the moment, I don't know. But uh, certainly we've already talked to the public bodies in Scotland and we will be continuing with those conversations. And it is one of the areas where I think people working across the public sector would be how we would envisage some of that support certainly being delivered. That's a, and the other, the other uh, consequential question, I suppose, from, from, from the first answer was, was around some of the controversial aspects of employment practice, and I'm thinking particularly of zero-hours contracts. Um, uh, the controversy, I guess, arises around whether all zero-hours contracts are exploitative, and if not, how you define the difference between a zero hours contract that's in the interests of all concerned and one that is simply a form of exploitation. Is that something that you envisage, or as an example of the kind of thing that you envisage your framework, making it easier uh, to, to, to come to conclusions around what is and what is not an appropriate employment practice? I, th I think in, t in terms of in terms of employment practices, and Linda's already said that we have the benefit of being able to study evidence, um, and there is a body of evidence out there about zero hours contracts, about the living wage, about all sorts of different flexible working practices. So we will have the opportunity to study, to analyse, but we have not at this stage discussed or made any decisions about how much detail the, re the, the report and the framework will go into. Thanks very much. Very helpful. OK. Jake uh, Brady. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, I wonder if I may ask uh, about job quality. We, we've received submissions from the CD SCDI and CBI highlighting the difficulty in defining job quality. And, of course, the potential impact of job quality <coughs> Uh, on productivity is quite uh, severe. In your, among your five themes is one uh, headed effective voice, with dialogue and decision making, uh, participation, partnership, etc. Do you intend to look at the possibility of equity participation and shared ownership of companies and how, on the basis of your different backgrounds, how do you view how do you actually view that working from a union perspective or worker perspective and also from a management perspective? 
Um, so and I, th I thought one of the interesting pieces of evidence that I think came to you from Patricia Finlay on the job quality piece was about expectation and the care that needs to be taken in terms of what job quality will mean to different individuals and what their expectations are in the job. So if I can just mention that first. In terms of the effective voice and alternative structures, I think, again, going back to the issue of evidence, what we will draw on are the various examples in, in evidence of different structures which work. And the, there, are, there are obviously many examples, including shared ownership, employee ownership. Um, but again, it's not, it's not an issue we've addressed in any detail at this stage. No, we, we, I, th I think it's, we, ha we haven't addressed it in any detail. And again, there is evidence there. And I think, we, I think we'll say this a lot this morning, but we haven't ruled anything in, but we haven't ruled anything out. And I, I mean, maybe slightly flippant comment, but in terms of my background, Linda's background, we're actually working well together as co-chairs in my view at least. Um, so, so that maybe says something about effective voice, unless of course Linda chooses to disagree with me. I'm happy to agree with my co-chair on that point. Yeah. In terms of the international uh, review that you've made, and uh, understand it's cursory and you've a lot more to do, uh, will you in fact look at this as, as, as one of the potential areas for improving job quality and therefore productivity in the marketplace. Because certainly, in my experience is, some countries do it <clears throat> quite effectively. I mean, again, some of the evidence that I think we will look at is evidence that was garnered as part of um, Surrey and Woods Commission into developing the young workforce, which involved, as I understand it, visits to Germany, Finland and some other countries where various models of ownership were looked at as part of how <laughs> organisations operated and operated mm. successfully. So again, the, there is evidence around around these issues that we'll look at, but we we haven't yet we haven't yet sat down and discussed or considered. Okay. I wonder, I mean, just just one uh, last question associated with this. Um, Again, we know that you're going through the process of what you're going to look at. And one of the frustrations I certainly had in running companies was uh, people being promoted and being promoted on merit. Now, we have different agendas, of course, going on in terms of balance, seeking balance, whether it's ethnicity, gender, what have you. Will you consider merit uh, and how you promote merit as, as a review? We'll, we'll talk about management later, but uh, as one of the criteria that you will look at seriously I'm not sure I, I'm not sure I wholly well let me give you an example understand I mean question. we have this talk about there should be equal number of women on 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 boards now I, I think that's unfair on women because there might be more or you know the the issue is where does merit where will merit uh, and skills so that round pegs are in round holes uh, so that we achieve the level of productivity that we uh, we desire so perhaps a personal view on that would be around the opportunity being equality of opportunity. <clears throat> and I would take that equality of opportunity having then a merit piece to it. Right. Um, <clears throat> it's not, it's interesting enough, not something that we've talked about specifically, but we'll take that away and, and think about it in that context. Okay. Thank you. Can I just just very briefly comment? I mean, I think from my point of view, then how appointment processes take place is one thing. But part of, I think, what we're looking at is that people have the opportunity to use their skills, upskill, be developed, go through training exercises. And if that is successful... <coughs> then I believe that would lead to your merit being met. Okay. Okay. Um, John Thank you very much. <clears throat> Just to observe on that point that I think the disproportionate number of white men 
um, in power is not a, a reflection in merit, and that is why we do need to have an equal opportunities policy. However, um, in terms of fairness, you're going to try and define what's fair work. Will you define, it's really to follow up from Lewis's point, what is not fair? I think where we will get to are examples of good practice and the extent to which we, show, we give examples of poor practice will probably be part of that. Would you be We're, willing to be explicit about it? I if I give you an example, I mean, I also, I'm interested in how you're going to have a proper sense. It's not a theoretical thing. This is people live with um, low pay and um, exploitative zero-hour contracts, which sounds like a label, but is there a place for testimony in your work where you're going to hear properly what these stories are, what it actually means to be somebody who from one week to the next doesn't know how many hours they're doing? So there's a big difference between being a freelance operator who maybe one month will get X number of hours and another a not, and somebody who's relying on the local hotel to give them work that's going to fund their, their support for their families. So I wonder if, if how are you going... It's very persuasive to hear the story of what it means to be in that kind of working situation in order to change opinion, and I wonder if you're going to try and do that so that you, you breathe life into the notion of what fair work and unfair work is. I, th I think we are, we are trying to do that, um, both through engaging with the STUC, its affiliates, its representatives and its members, um, but also through the Citizens Advice Bureau to reach out and get case studies that the CAB itself um, has been involved in. And I, I completely agree, they are absolutely powerful, powerful stories, no, no doubt about that. And I think to come back, we need to, as a convention, look at the, the powerful stories and marry that up to the evidence or use them to create further evidence to be able to define what fair work is. I, mean, I, I hear what you say about STUC in particular, but we know that a unionised workplace is more likely to be less exploitative. So how do you get beyond that? And Citizens Advice Bureau is one bit of it, but I wonder if there are other um, areas that you could explore in that. But maybe, I suppose, the other question I have for you is whether you will be providing what you believe to be an analysis of economic impact of unfair work. Because, in a sense, you're going to persuade the employers, FSB or whoever, with evidence that actually it's... it's it is not beneficial economically or in business terms to have people in these kind of circumstances. And I wonder, again, how are you going to provide that or attempt to provide that analysis of the economic impact of poor practice? So, again, I think what we might be doing there particularly is providing evidence, seeking to provide evidence of the benefits of fair work, economic, the economic benefits of fair work, and that comes back to the point about engaging the business community. Why do they look at fair work? Now, there is a general assumption that there's a clear answer to that, which is they ought to be providing fair work. But in terms of really engaging them and helping them improve on that, then having a compelling answer to the why is this important to your business why will this help you be a high-performing organisation? I think will be one of the ways that we will show the benefits and economic benefits of fair work. But wouldn't you agree there are some very successful organisations with very poor working practices, so they may think, well, my model's working fine. Is it not therefore important to create, to give evidence of the disbenefits of poor practice as well as appealing to them to be fair? From a personal point of view, I don't disagree with that, and it may be that we need to counter good with bad. And the convention hasn't got into the detail; we haven't. We're not far enough along the journey. But looking at the the trajectory where minimum standards or legal compliance is below what we say is fair, it may be, and I have no idea, 
but it may be that some of our report and recommendation is to increase legal compliance in some area or areas. I don't know. And I go back to the point that how do you persuade people for whom the economic model they're using is working for them? Otherwise, we wouldn't have an increase in zero hours contracts and increased evidence of exploitative practice if it wasn't somehow benefiting somebody. And you will have to counterbalance that with evidence of disbenefits. And you know, I would have thought that the Fair Work Convention would have an important role in not just appealing to people, but saying, actually, these are the consequences longer term for your business. It, it, we have not got to the stage of considering how we might articulate how to engage people in the debate, but I'm sure that's something that we will consider at that point, how we, how we do it. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, Gordon McDonald. Convener, um, part of my first question has actually been touched upon, but I, I was keen to try and understand. Uh, you said there was international research on each of the five themes. Have other countries um, tried to identify a, a framework, a fair work convention framework? Um, and how successful has it been in other countries? So... What is happening at the moment is that that research is being assembled for us by the team at Strathclyde, so we've not delved into it in any detail. Right. In the very preliminary presentations we've had, my understanding is, and I think Anne referred to this, that Finland is, is an example where work has been done, and Australia is another country where, where mm. work has been ongoing. But we're not at this, we've, we've not yet delved into the... Uh, the, that, that research and, and, and what's to be presented to us, but that will be coming to us in the near future. Right, OK. Um, so moving on to my, my second question, um, we're in a situation where we have saw uh, the introduction of employment tribunal fees, which has had a, a massive reduction in the number of cases that are coming. We've got the welfare reform changes coming through and we had the tax credit an announcements yesterday. And we've got the forthcoming trade union bill going through the UK Parliament. How, what effect is that going to have on the, 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 the work that you're doing? And I know you haven't looked at the how yet, but will that make the how more difficult and change your recommendations? I think we, we are obviously cognizant of the, the proposals and the changes that are going ahead. I, I don't know that it will change our recommendations, but there will be there will be views that we have to take on what impacts what impacts what currently exists against the impact that that may have in the event that changes go ahead. But we haven't we haven't got to that got to that stage yet. Thank you. Good morning. I just apologise for having been a couple of minutes late at the start of the meeting. Um, just still with this, this question of what the concept of fair work means, um, the briefing that we've been given here quotes the Cabinet Secretary for Fair Work Skills and Training. Fair work means that everyone is entitled to expect access to the labour market, job security fair reward and so on. Entitled to expect is, is quite an interesting phrase. It doesn't mean that everyone has job security, but everyone's entitled to expect job security. Isn't it pretty clear that in relation to something like zero hours contracts, that means it should be for the employee to decide whether a zero hours contract suits them, uh, not for the employer to determine this is what you're getting. Put up with it. Not sure that I'm not sure that as co-chairs of the convention, we could necessarily answer that. As individuals, we absolutely could, but I, I just don't think the convention has reached a position where we can we can do that. I think what the convention is trying to do is to make access easier, opportunity better, treatment more fair, whatever that, 
that fairness is. Um, I question of what fairness is, and the Cabinet Secretary's view is that it means that everyone is entitled to expect job security. Is that, yeah. is that what we're trying to achieve here? Entitled to expect job security, I think we have started to have a discussion about what job security is mm -hmm. and what it means. And I think the Convention is in a place where it doesn't mean a job for life the same job for life. It means being equipped to continue to work in other jobs that are still fulfilling and quality jobs, whatever mm. that quality may be. The Cabinet Secretary also thinks that everyone should be entitled to expect fair reward in this in this comment. Now the the gap between what young people earn on the minimum wage and what people over 21 earn on the minimum wage is already significant. With the uh, introduction of what is not a living wage but is being branded a, a national living wage by the UK government for those over 25, the gap between what young people earn and what those over 25 is going to be even bigger. You know, 16 year olds uh, potentially earning less than half of what 25 year olds earn. Is that something that you'll look at, the gap between what colleagues doing exactly the same job alongside each other are being paid based on their age? So one of the interesting themes that's already coming out from a number of the stakeholders is that what's fair may again be different at different stages of your career or, or age and stage. And I think that is something that we, are, we will be taking into account and looking at and trying to reflect in any framework that, that we come up with. And that won't just be for young people, it will be, I think, I think that particular comment came from um, female sta a female stakeholder group and the fact that for them during their working life, fair would mean different things at different stages. Um, I think there were also comments from older workers that again fair might be different at the later stages of their working career so we will I think attempt to address that throughout what, what, what we're thinking and I think that will inevitably across some of our themes and as Anne said our themes will be cross-cutting look at um, reward. I suspect most people would agree with the general point that uh, fair might mean different things at different stages in life and someone who's spent a long time uh, Increasing their skills or experience might expect to be rewarded for that. But if we're if we're talking about jobs, pretty much at the the bottom end of the pay scale, the bottom end of what employers can get away with, um, it seems to me that the the gap on age levels there is is reaching a point where it's unjustifiable. Uh, a guy from uh, I think it was JD Sports was on the radio this morning. Uh, talking about how much it's going to cost to implement this national living wage and, and will that be a burden. I said, well, we'll just have to absorb that with operational efficiencies. And you know what he means. You know, he's going to try and make sure that he's not employing people over 25 uh, more than he needs to and that he can you know, squeeze more work out of those at the, the lower rates. Um, if this is the kind of impact that that uh, unequal policy has, it's going to increase unfairness and there'll be very little that we can do about that. I think, as Linda says, it's been raised in a number of ways by different stakeholders. And another stakeholder talked about the impact of the minimum wage, the living wage, the new living wage, um, not just on on costs, on on wage costs, but in terms of differentials with the rest of the the pay <coughs> scales, in terms of equal pay, and these are all massive issues. Mm that I have no doubt we will consider, but we, we, can't, we can't sit here and tell you what the, um, what the outcome's going to be. I'm just keen to know it's on the agenda. I know you don't, you're not here with a, a list of answers yet. Uh, one, one final question, uh, if I may, again, to establish whether you're going to look at uh, one particular uh, aspect of, of fair remuneration and its connection to, to being treated with dignity and respect. Um, very often we'll hear uh, stories of um, senior management uh, 
uh, or chief executives being given huge uh, salary increases or bonuses. Uh, very often when times are hard, it's people at the lower end of the spectrum uh, who see their pay reduced or their hours reduced. Is it part of your agenda looking at what fairness means in terms of remuneration to think about whether the bulk of the profit that a company is making is going to the bulk of the people whose work is generating that profit? Uh, maximum wage ratios would be one way of achieving that. It's something that we haven't looked at yet. We haven't looked at it. It's something on the agenda, though? Something the idea of, of can... connecting what the highest and lowest paid people in an organisation are getting so that you know, if the, if the person in the top office gets a big hike, the person who cleans that office gets a, a fair share of that increased uh, remuneration. There's no reason why we can't look at it. I don't, I don't see any reason why we can't look at it, but we can't commit um, to any particular outcome to the, the deliberations. We can certainly ask Professor Finlay to give us some, mm -hmm. some evidence to look at. Well, I, I hope it'll be examined. That's, that's all. Thank you. Um, Richard Lyle. Thank uh, you, Good morning. Uh, so I take it from the last question asked by Park, Patrick Harvey. You welcome submissions from people to ask you to look at things that presently at this moment in time you're possibly not looking at. But can I turn to... Uh, Anne Douglas said that in a reply to one of my other colleagues, um, you may look at legal compliance... Will it be the, inten the Convention's intention to possibly, uh, after looking at it, possibly making uh, recommendations to whatever government, whether it's the Scottish Government or the UK Government, uh, to possibly amend employment law, uh, employment practice? Um, we all believe in a fair day's work for a fair day's pay, but unfortunately, as we know, that's not happening in some areas. So do we intend to, do we intend to look at changing uh, are recommending changes in employment law? I, d I don't believe we're, we're at a stage where we're going to say that we are rec we are going to recommend changes, but I would say that we, w we have neither ruled in nor ruled out being in a position when we report that that report could include amendments, changes to, to employment law or other laws come to that. So basically, what you thought was an easy thing is getting bigger and bigger and we, bigger by the moment. I don't think we ever, either of us, ever thought it was an easy thing, but there is no doubt from the engagement that we have already undertaken that there are huge expectations out there um, of what the Convention is going to be expected to achieve. Yeah. Um, and I think the more, the more we work as a convention, the bigger the agendas get. Um, so it's, it's not an easy task. And I think the challenge for us is producing something that is manageable in the first instance and practical that makes a difference. And that's why I'd go back to what I said earlier, which is that we may seek to prioritise some areas where we think things can be done more quickly to achieve a better outcome and make recommendations that other areas are looked into further on, on things particularly which may take longer to shift. Just to, just to get it on the record, um, do you have a website? Do you have a um, where people can, who are maybe in a, an unfair, feel they're in an unfair job or they want, they want input into uh, your work? Do you have a website or how people can contact you in, in order to give their possibly their, you know, the cleaner and in, in the the, uh, the company you're talking about, that the CEO has just got a big pay rise or, or whatever? Do you have somewhere people can contact you? We, we do have a website mm. and we have an email address and we can provide those so that they go on the Would record. you like to read it off for the record? Um, if someone can <laughs> give it to me. Um, but we can, we can provide that to, to get it included. Okay. That, I sorry. suspect if you Google... Fair Work Convention. Yeah. You might, up, if you come up there. Yep. Other search engines are available. <laughs> <laughs> Last search engines. Thank you. Thank you, convener. Thank you, Dennis Roberts. Yeah. Got a follow-up. Just, just a, a very brief one uh, on the basis of what uh, Anne Douglas has just been saying. Um, is March a realistic timeline then? Because you know, from what we've heard this morning, 
um, we're looking at the watts and the hows are going to have to, you know, be incorporated. Is 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 March a realistic timeline to get a report out? I think it's realistic for an an outline. What we've been what we've been asked to produce is a framework, mm -hmm. and I think what we are hoping to do partly this morning is manage expectations of the extent to which that framework will be fully populated. Um, but we have undertaken to produce a framework by March, and, and that's what we will do. That's right. Thank you. Okay. Um, Chip you want to come back in? Yes, I wonder, uh, just, just following Mr Harvey's comment about the uh, statement on the radio this morning about operational efficiencies, um, we currently have a situation which one believes will be recurring for some time about refugees coming into the country uh, and one would hope that in your conversation mm -hmm. that's not seen as a vehicle for depression of wages uh, in any particular geography. But I wonder if I may ask, uh, the, the work that you're going to do obviously will cover all industrial sectors uh, and job quality and the definition of it, it will, will, will vary. How, how are you going to approach that? in terms of looking at job quality across all industrial sectors? I think the, the convention membership includes representatives, not representatives, mm. includes people drawn from private, public and third sectors, as well as from the trade union movement. Um, our stakeholder engagement with help from the public agencies is looking at the sector specific bodies that they are involved with both SE High and you know both all of SE High and SDS. Um, so we hope to reach out through those established mechanisms to different sectors. Um, I, I don't know that I can say any more than that. So I think what, what I might add at this stage would be that at the moment I think what we might talk about are the characteristics of job quality and we might then seek to engage the sectors and the public bodies in helping to define it for, for their particular area. I think it would be a monumental challenge to define it for everyone and I think that may, we may decide that that might not be achievable particularly in terms of our time scales. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, I think that probably uh, is the end of our questions. Can I thank you on behalf of the committee very much for coming along this morning and helping us. I think we're very interested to see uh, the outputs from your work. Uh, March probably is not the best timing for ourselves. We might be slightly preoccupied with other matters in March, but uh, I'm sure our uh, successor committee in the next parliament would be very interested in following up some of this work uh, with, with yourselves and the convention uh, and looking at where you take the framework and what the next steps are. I think one of the things that will be very interesting for the convention also is I think this committee is going to report on this inquiry in December. And I think that will be interesting for us to see uh, the, your report and will be helpful in our deliberations. So Good. thank you very much Good. for your time okay. Well, yeah, Thank you for coming. Um, we're a little bit ahead of the clock, so we'll suspend until 10.30. Thank you.
Okay, if we can uh, reconvene, uh, I'd like to welcome our uh, second uh, panel of witnesses and introduce everybody starting on my on my left, we have Gordon McGuinness, who is Deputy Director of Industry and Enterprise Networks for School Development Scotland. Uh, Denise Horsfall, who is Work Services Director for Scotland for Department of Work and Pensions. Uh, Jane Martin, Managing Director, Customer Operations, Scottish Enterprise. Uh, Charlotte Wright, who is Sector and Business Development Director, Highland Islands Enterprise. And Katrina McCauley, Head of Service, Economic Growth, Economy and Communities at North Ayrshire Council and also representing uh, Slade. Thank you all for coming along. Uh, I think we're going to run this session probably for around 90 uh, minutes or so. Now, I appreciate we've got quite a large panel, so I don't expect you all to answer every question. Um, I, and, and clearly, you know, we have quite a, a, a disparate panel in terms of interest. So what I would ask members to do when they're asking questions, if they can direct them initially at one member of the panel. Um, but then if you do want to come in, uh, in relation to something somebody else has said or a question directed to somebody else. If you just catch my eye, I'll try and bring you in as best I can as the time allows. Uh, there's a range of issues I think we want to cover. We're looking at uh, public support for, for businesses, issues around uh, quality uh, of management, uh, productivity, issues around some of the stuff DWP is involved in. Um, and uh, we'll do our best to get through that. Um, but I'll just remind members to keep their questions uh, as brief and to the point as possible and answers as brief and to the point as possible would be helpful. Thank you. Can I start off um, around the question of public support? Maybe I could address this initially to uh, Scottish Enterprise and Highlands Islands Enterprise, um, just to get, get your view on this. Um, one thing that the committee is interested in looking at is how um, uh, Scottish Government, through its agencies, uh, provide support to try and encourage uh, good quality work. And we saw the uh, launch earlier this year of the uh, Scottish Government's uh, Business Pledge, which I think 100 uh, companies or organisations have now signed up to. And this is uh, where, where companies uh, agree, uh, for example, to pay the living wage, to not use exploitative zero-hours contracts, to, to invest in youth and, and uh, uh, play an active role in the community. I'm sure you're familiar with the details of that Business Pledge. Uh, when the business pledge was originally being mooted, there was suggestion that this, this would be tied into uh, additional support from the enterprise agencies. So I wonder if you could explain, maybe start with yourself, Jane Martin, explain from a Scottish enterprise perspective, what difference does it make to the support you provide if a company signs up to the, the business pledge? Um, at the moment, it, it, there's no conditionality. So we, we don't not support a company if they don't sign up to the business pledge. Um, what we have been doing over the past few months, however, is engaging particular account managed companies in the whole agenda. Um, I think to date we've spoken to over 250 businesses as part of our discussions about their growth, incidentally, not, as very, not going in with a specific discussion about the business pledge. Um, and those conversations have been going very, very well. There's a, there is an interest, you know, most businesses want to do the right thing. They recognise the importance of uh, good employment in terms of productivity and in terms of growing their bottom line, if you like. There's business benefits around all that. Um, so we've been having conversations with, with businesses about, it, about, about the, the agenda. Um, I think about 28 of the 100 that have signed up so far are account managed by Scottish Enterprise. We've got um, another 10 or 11 on the waiting list and another 10 or so that, that are, are actively considering it. So I think over time we, we're, we're having conversations to build a momentum and a movement, if you like, and, and an agenda. So that's where we're at right now. Um, where we have changed things is around the area of RSE, and it's particularly around youth employment. And this came about as on the back of uh, the work that Sir Ian Wood did, as opposed to the business pledge. And from February, every company that has signed up to RSE has agreed to a youth employment commitment. Uh, so, so that is one very specific change that's, that's happened. And we need to follow that through to make sure you know, we need to track it, you know, what does that actually mean in practice, those kind of things. But that's, that's one very specific change. Charlotte, do you want to add anything yeah. to that? Add in terms of some of the other elements of the pledge, uh, for example, uh, internationalising and innovation are really critical to uh, our strategic priorities in the Highlands and Islands. So if a business is uh, wanting to sign up to the pledge 
and need support uh, to develop those areas of, the, of their business, we're really keen to get in and support them and look at how they develop those aspects of the business in international trade and innovation, which help grow their business and their economy overall. And in relation to the point uh, Jane just made on young people as well, using programmes like our graduate placement programmes, which have a number of strands to support business and social enterprise and community, are another uh, element of support that we can bring in so that um, businesses are able to look at how they're employing young people as well. So there are um, key building blocks within the pledge which really mirror our strategic priorities and we wish to engage with businesses to support how they tackle those aspects. Okay, thank you for that. But I mean, just so we're clear, there's, there, there's no, uh, in terms of public support, there's no advantage to business for signing the pledge. You, you would get exactly the same support if, if you didn't. That's the case. Yeah, you're nodding. So, yes. Yes, that's fine. Okay. I mentioned what you said about RSA um, and how uh, that, that was being used. Um, I mean, I'm sure you're familiar with, with the case I'm, I'm going to refer to, but uh, Amazon came to Scotland, got very substantial support through RSA. It's a company which uh, there's been a great deal uh, of commentary in the press around some of its employment practices. Uh, clearly, people in the company would, 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 would dispute some of that, but but you know, it's one of the examples sometimes held up as a company which does use zero hours contracts quite extensively. And there have been uh, incidences of employees complaining about unfair treatment. Is it, is it right that RSA can be paid towards a company uh, in very substantial sums which may not have um, at the highest standards of, uh, of, uh, in, in terms of the way it treats its employees? So I think the message that we would certainly want to give out in Scotland is that we value excellent employers, you know, and I, I actually, one of the, part of my job is also about how we promote Scotland overseas, and one of the things that we're currently looking at is how we can actually get to the point where if a company invests in Scotland, they're saying something about themselves as employers. Now, that's a kind of long-term piece. Um, in terms of Amazon, uh, the RSA funding dated back to over a decade ago. We are actually uh, seeking conversations with senior management ab about some of the recent stuff to see if we can help them in any way. So. Uh, I don't think this is a yes or no answer from my perspective. Amazon's also created over a thousand jobs in certain communities of Scotland that needed the jobs. So it, it, it's it's very complex. Okay, I, I've got some other members. I think want to want to come in and, and pursue this. And, and I think I think we'd understand it's complex. I think just what the committee is trying to get at is in terms of the way government uses its policies, the way the government uses its spend. Is there more government can do to try and encourage fair work and uh, perhaps giving large sums of monies to companies which are not exemplars in that regard is, is not the, the best use of money. I think Lewis MacDonald was quite keen to come in. I, I just want to check one point, I think which Jane Martin mentioned, engaging with uh, account managed companies on the business pledge and fair work agenda, and, and I'm sure Charlotte Wright's in the same position. Uh, is your engagement on those issues uh, only with account managed companies or other ways in which you can promote the same proposition in the wider economy? And so uh, whilst we work with a, a specific group of account managed companies through works we do to develop uh, key sectors, our general business engagement and work with communities give us a number of opportunities and uh, networking events and platforms to promote good practice and the pledge being part of that story. That's, that's very helpful. And is, in, in, in doing that, is there a difference in what Highlands and Islands Enterprise is able to do because of your social remit and what Scottish, Scottish Enterprise is able to do in terms of going beyond, if you like, the uh, business conversation and talking about the wider impact of, of good practices. In terms of what we do under our strengthening communities remit, yes, that will be wider in that we um, engage with a number of social enterprises, community businesses, and actually account manage a number of whole communities as well and in helping build their capacity and developing their approach to what they want to do for their communities, we will often engage perhaps in a more intensive way to help build capacity, but also give that kind of advice and support about how they might build their own employment networks if they're uh, running social enterprises, for example. And we do find that in, in that part of the agenda, they are quite values-driven as well, 
so that they are um, often very keen to engage in some of those processes. We'll support them with things like um, uh, investors in young people, graduate placements and capacity building to uh, enable them to respond to that. that. That's helpful. One of the interesting areas of discussion in the last panel was around uh, the, uh, uh, if you like, putting in place the evidence of what link there might be between quality work, quality of work on the one hand, and uh, high performance and uh, growth in companies on the other hand. Is, uh, is there anything from the experience of, of either of the enterprise companies that is relevant to that? In other words, are you in a position where perhaps you might be offering evidence to the Fair Work Convention on, on, on what the link is between good employment practice and, and good uh, economic growth? We've got a wealth between us of really good case studies at a, at a business level. So, for example, in, in Caithness, in, in the north of Scotland, we've seen a company, uh, Denshi Power, working through support on R&D, actually um, exceed all of their expectations in relation to job creation and uh, the wage rates that they're able to pay, now paying wage rates in excess of £33,000 average, which is significant for that part of the, the, the country. And it's these compelling, strong stories about what can be done with that network of support that we'd be really happy to share with the Convention. The, the other thing to add is um, there's, there's a lot of work going on, even at the macro level, in terms of really understanding the evidence base and in terms of how tackling inequalities can actually drive competitiveness rather than looking at it through the other lens. Um, we've recently been in discussions with the IMF at senior level to see if we can actually learn from best practice elsewhere. What does that evidence look like? How can we use that to measure some of the things that we're doing in Scotland? So, again, a bit like your earlier um, kind of witnesses, early stage for us, but we're looking even at a macro level as well as kind of case study level to see if we can garner very, very strong evidence in order to see what works and, and, and make the case, if you like. That's, that's, I mean, I think it's all, all of that is interesting. In, in terms of the uh, work you're doing with the IMF, do you anticipate that that ultimately will be published in, in some form? Is it something that can inform the Convention, inform uh, Parliament and, and, and be useful beyond your own internal work? Um, I would hope so, but it's, it's very, very early stages. The one thing that I would point out to the committee in, in looking at this that, that I, I discovered is the World Economic Forum <coughs> are doing a piece of work and they have actually put a call out internationally to seek best practice and examples of um, how tackling inequality and inclusive growth is driving competitiveness. And they are due to report in that in October. Um, uh, in a, a conference in Abu Dhabi. So I'll be re really interested to see that report, and I suspect it, you will be too. Thank you. Okay, I've got members want to come in on this question of, of, of public support. So we'll just go, go around uh, the members, start with Pat Harvey. Thank you. Good morning. Um, yeah, just following on from this, this line of questioning that began around conditionality, uh, you, you mentioned some new level of conditionality attached to RSA around a, a youth employment uh, commitment. Uh, presumably that includes things like paying the, the minimum, uh, the, the living wage to, to young people as well, yeah? Uh, could, you, could you say a bit more about what exactly is the condition that has to be met in order now for people to qualify for RSA? Um, at, at the moment, what we're asking companies to do is to make a commitment to having a youth employment policy, including a, a, a target for the percentage of the workforce that would be under 25. So that's what we're looking at right now. Um, what that would mean in practice would be that um, we would be working with certain companies around their broader organisational development, looking at recruitment policies, business strategy, retention, organisational culture. It'll depend on the companies. Um, so that there's a whole kind of raft of things. The living wage to be paid to those young people as well. Yes, I will double check that. But yes, I'm sure okay. that it, I'm sure that it does. I will clarify that for the committee in case I'm wrong. I wonder if you'd reflect on whether there's a, a case for a broader approach to conditionality in the range of uh, support uh, services, grant schemes, and indeed procurement policies uh, with the, the the money that comes in the public purse. Um, you know, if we want to achieve a change in the way that labour markets operate in Scotland, uh, you know, shouldn't we be pulling every lever that we can? Shouldn't we be using these kind of techniques to ensure that, you know, if you 
if you don't pay the living wage, if you do exploit people on zero hours contracts against their wishes, uh, if you do have a, a range of other practices, then you simply won't get access to the, the support of the public purse. Isn't that reasonable? Interesting to see how what's uh, begun with RSA um, what impact that actually has and how that makes uh, a difference um, I think the, the approach that we have taken to date has been very much about uh, promoting the good aspects of what can be done in our engagement with businesses without going as far as to make it um, absolutely conditional so that the approach is really um, more about the carrot than the stick being able to develop um, really uh, the full economic reasons why uh, an employer might want to go down those routes and build up those good stories so that then... I can entirely the, the rationale for that and the, the, the motivation for it. Uh, but it sits alongside a welfare system which is more stick than carrot mm -hmm. at the moment. The evidence that we've been given, the views we've been given by the NHS in Scotland uh, and by Citizens Advice Scotland is that the welfare system and particularly the sanctions regime is being used to bully people uh, to force them very often into some of the most exploitative jobs that we've got. People can be heavily sanctioned, left without food or heating or money for their rent uh, if they turn down even some of the more exploitative jobs. So why is all the carrot going to the employers and all the stick going to the workers? That's an interesting question. I'm not sure if I can answer all of the points in relation to welfare, but in, in relation to how we work with, with business, um, as I say, the approach so far has been about um, developing the priorities that we have in uh, fulfilling the government's economic strategy. And some of that has been a push agenda around international trade, around innovation, I guess particularly for us in the Highlands and Islands, with a small business space and with perhaps not as much penetration into some of those areas that we'd like to see. And our engagement has been very much on those positive terms to support, build and develop so that we can see those changes starting to be made. I, I just you know, want to, to raise this uh, for people to reflect on, that this is a relationship between employers and employees. They're all being given welfare, uh, whether through the, the benefit system or through a corporate welfare system. Surely it's important that there is at least as much conditionality attached to the employers in the support and corporate welfare they're getting as there is to employees and the way that they're being treated. Mm. Uh, I think I need to respond about uh, the, uh, the sanction regime. Um, as far as DWP is concerned, it engages with employers and employers that pay the national minimum wage. Now, I know that's different to, to the living wage as far as the Scottish Government is concerned, but we would not engage with people that are exploitative. So if you have any examples of that, then I really need to understand what that is. I think, I think perhaps just meaning something different by exploitation. Okay. I mean, the, the national minimum wage leaves people in poverty. Right, That's so, why there's a need for a living wage. And all I'm saying is that it is perhaps the definition of what we're talking about, so it's being very clear that it's less than a living wage, but it is mm. a national minimum wage. There's a slightly different uh, line of questioning, and we do have t questions later, I think, on, on, uh, on sanctions, so we can perhaps just park that for the moment. Uh, I think there are other members who want to come in on this question of a support conditionality. Um, Joanne Lamont. To go back to Jean Martin's point about Amazon, are you saying that if that decision on RSA would be made today, Amazon wouldn't qualify for the money? No, um, I'm, I'm saying that the way that we currently work with businesses, we would be having a conversation with Amazon now that we wouldn't have had 10 years ago. Um, to respond to that conversation, I mean, I hear what you said about it creates jobs, but we know that individuals have traded off their conditions for employment in times of recession. It looks as if that when the government is funding something, you're happy for that trade-off too. I may mean, understand it, the question of jobs, but is it not an irony that on the one hand, the Scottish Government has a fair work convention, and on the other hand, is rewarding a company that has no obligation to address the questions that the Fair Work Commission is going to consider? I mean, I think that is a really, really fair challenge, and it is something that we're wrestling with as an organisation in terms of what that might mean going forward. As Charlotte said, what we're keen to do is develop a very strong partnership with business and industry around this agenda, and I almost take the carrot approach. Um, in terms of would we categorically say no to Amazon um, at this point in time, I, I can't say hand on heart that we would. 
it is the question of the carrot and the stick. You have a lot of carrot at your disposal, very significant amounts of money, which other organisations and other companies presumably wouldn't mind um, being able to attract. So would it not be reasonable to use the power of the public purse to drive up standards in terms of jobs, especially since some of our evidence is that some of these jobs are so exploitative that you're actually your health is better if you're unemployed, which must be a pretty sort of stark statement for people to have to reflect on. I, I, th I, think, I think that's fair. I, I think it's fair. These may be policy matters more, more to address to the Scottish Government than to, to one of its agencies. And then in a policy framework which says when you make decisions on funding, there should be a conditionality around the quality of work and expectation of basic levels of standards for anyone who's going to qualify. Um, to confirm what I said at the start, we don't operate under conditionality at the moment, with the exception of the, the, the youth policy that I, that I talked about. Obviously, under legislative and all, all those kind of things, we absolutely do comply with, mm. but there is certainly no current policy. Which so so the, the notion of conditionality is accepted, given the, the decision on youth, but it's not, it's not uh, broadened to address the question of fair pay, or fair work, rather. Yes. Thank you. I think, Richard, I want, you want to come in on this issue? Yes. Uh, mm -hmm. You don't mind, um, convener, and I, I want to actually uh, concentrate on the pos positive aspects of Scottish Enterprise um, and read into the record. Scottish Enterprise, you commit over £32 million each year to inclusive growth, amounts to 10% of your total budget, £19 million for job creation, safeguarding grant support schemes, which includes RSA, which is Regional Selective Assistance, and over the next three years you're forecasting some like 22 to 28,000 planned jobs. Um, I had a, an excellent meeting with one of your representatives a couple of weeks ago in regards to local job clubs, local job fairs, to bring that to my area. And um, would you agree with me that, uh, and do you believe that Scottish Enterprise should be the powerhouse to promote better jobs and conditions? And uh, would you, or do you, promote locally within areas uh, uh, to talk to other companies that you're not micromanaging in order to bring more jobs uh, and better quality jobs. Do you have local job fairs uh, or would you consider, I know you're doing so many other things, mm -hmm. but would you consider bringing local job fairs to local areas in order to inform and, and, and entice uh, people to, to bring better quality uh, work practices to their area and also better quality jobs to the area. Yes, absolutely. Um, where, we've, where we've done this in, in local areas is tended to be part of a strong partnership. So it's been Scottish Enterprise or Highlands and Islands Enterprise working with local authorities, business gateway, colleges potentially, local chambers of commerce, and actually that strong partnership approach, is, is which means that we're all saying the same thing, we're all championing the same agenda, is what, where I think we really see um, the best impact. So absolutely, we're, we're, we're represented on all local community planning partnerships, for example, we're having these discussions at a, a local level, and we're happy to support any way that we can. Thank you. John McAlpin, do you want to come in on this on this yes, point? On yeah. this specific point. I, yeah. I guess I just want to address the um, the points that have already been made about support to companies to um, the lady representing local authorities, because obviously in my area, uh, most of the support is delivered through Business Gateway. So do you apply any criteria when it comes to fair work when um, in employment practices, when Business Gateway is, adv is advising and supporting companies? Yes, um, I'm happy just to maybe to explain the role of local government in this agenda to, to set the context. Um, I'm here to represent Slade, which is all 32 local authorities. And I suppose we are in a, a unique position in that we have both a role in uh, supporting people into employment as well as supporting small businesses. Um, and to, to give you an idea of the scale uh, of the work that we do, uh, last year we uh, provided support to 17,000 businesses across Scotland, uh, across our 32 local authorities. 
authorities and supported 25,000 unemployed people into work. So we probably are in quite a unique position to have an understanding of the issues for business uh, and, and the challenges around the Fair Work agenda, uh, but also to understand um, the impact of unemployment and, uh, and poverty within our local communities. Um, going back to maybe just some of the points that were previously uh, raised, which all, all connect to your question, which is around the business pledge and local authorities' role within that. Um, I, I, there is a, a broad support for uh, the aspirations around the business pledge and, and through COSLA uh, there has been a support uh, indicated for uh, the business pledge. I think the challenge comes with the resource implications uh, behind uh, supporting companies that are working to uh, achieving the nine uh, commitments um, that are part of the business pledge. And uh, at the minute, if you look on, on the website, uh, you will see uh, I think there's something like 95 businesses that are signed up for the business pledge and only two of those are business gateway uh, growth uh, companies. So, so clearly the focus has been around the larger companies and I think my, our membership would indicate we feel that they should be leading the way in terms of the fair work agenda. Um, I think the challenges for smaller businesses are probably different. That's not to say that when we speak to small businesses, um, they are supportive of the, 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 the either, the, there should be two things, they either have no awareness of that agenda or where they do have an awareness, they're very supportive of the broad principles and the aspirations behind that. And we have certainly examples of where we're working with companies um, that their motivation and drive for growth is very often uh, driven by the need to improve terms and conditions and uh, improve opportunities. So they're very, very driven uh, to do that. Uh, can I just, thanks very much. I could, if I could just interrupt yeah. you. Just to, when, when Jane Martin answered this point, she said that there wasn't conditionality um, with regards to Scottish enterprise-supported companies. Are you saying there's no conditionality at local authority level either? There's no conditionality. Right. Okay, thank you. Um, right, well, I think we, for the moment, have dealt with that line of questioning, so we're going to move on and bring in Dennis Robertson on a slightly different topic. Hey, thanks, convener. Um, I wonder if we could turn to SDS uh, for the moment. Uh, SDS, in your submission, said that um, you align a lot of your activities uh, with regard to the Fair Work Convention and looking at things like innovation, uh, productivity, skills. I wonder if you could maybe expand on that. I mean, the, the, you see you're doing a number of activities. Could you maybe expand on the activities you, you are undertaking? Thank you. Uh, first of all, I mean, I think some of the kind of questions earlier related to, you know, fair work, and we heard in the earlier evidence session that the definition of that is still to be defined, so we're, we're looking forward to the outputs from the, the Fair Work Convention and how we'll incorporate those into our operating activities. Uh, in terms of skills, then, the areas that we're, we're working on, uh, particularly around apprenticeships in the Scottish Government, and SDS has held a firm line in terms of employment conditions attached to that. So we're looking for full-time employment uh, over a, a sustained period. So the Scottish Employment Recruitment Initiative that uh, we'll deliver in conjunction with the local authorities there's got to be at least the offer of a contract for a year or more before that uh, is, is deliverable. And where they are paying the living wage, the apprenticeships tend to follow the, uh, certainly the, the minimum guidelines are for uh, the national minimum wage. Many employers pay above that, but the Scottish Employer Recruitment Incentive pays an additional bonus of £500 if a local employer is paying the uh, living wage uh, in terms of recognised at a Scottish, Scottish level. So the areas that we're working in around the apprenticeships obviously aligns to the youth employment strategy, which has been heavily informed by developing Scotland's young workforce. So a lot of the work we're doing there, uh, one is to boost numbers to 30,000 by 2020. But we've got an aggressive uh, programme of work underway just now around foundation apprenticeships. And that builds on some of the models that were referred to earlier on in terms of international best practice that we've seen in Switzerland and Germany and Norway. So we've done two pilots this year, uh, both in Fife and then in West Lothian, where the first year of an apprenticeship has actually been undertaken in a transition phase in the senior phase of, of school. Uh, with employer uh, input to that, so uh, both the pilots have been in the engineering sector 
and we'll roll that out in the, the current year to, I think, 19 uh, local authorities across a number of uh, occupational areas. And we're hoping, as Sareen Wood had looked at within the uh, Commission, that we get a much better, our young people at school get a much better experience of, of work-based learning. And that's not to channel everybody down a modern apprenticeship route, but the educational tariff that will be achieved through this will stand them in good stead whether they go to further education or to higher education. And we'll also uh, Gordon, the, the earlier questions I was putting um, to the Fair Convention with, with regard to uh, the rural and maybe some of yeah. the remote areas, uh, and we'll probably come on to agenda and diversity in a second, uh, as you would expect from me. <laughs> <laughs> um, but with regard to um, rural and remote areas, I mean, how successful can SDS be within those areas, given some of the challenges that uh, the people within the rural and remote areas face? Yeah, it, it, is a, it is a challenge. I, I'm a member of the UHI FE Regional Board and uh, Michael Foxley is uh, passionate about the, addressing the cha challenges of rurality. Uh, for us, uh, when we look at employers of scale within these areas and how we connect them up to foundation apprenticeships, there will be challenges. Uh, interestingly enough, I think some of the the uh, most positive responses we've had has been from areas like the Western Isles and Shetland, where I think they see real opportunities of exp highlighting the opportunities to young people while they're at school, and rather than them getting into a mindset that they've got to move off the island for opportunities that they can actually connect to employers and a structured programme of learning that would you know, keep them uh, anchored, not, not let them go off the island, but that there's real economic opportunities and development opportunities in the islands. Uh, some of the work that we've done around Highlands and Islands, uh, around the Regional Skill Investment Plan, had recognised the outward migration of young people uh, to the central belt, both for education but also for employment. And I think there's been a concerted effort across the, the Highlands to address these issues. We'll report back to the Convention of Highlands and Islands, I think the 4th of October, in terms of progress in that area. So the big investment in UHI, I think, is, is, uh, is helping, but also the development of apprenticeship models with companies like Cap Gemini. So I think this year Cap Gemini are probably into about their 50th apprenticeship from being a startup within Inverness. So these are opportunities uh, from a starting point for young people, but with great career paths with a global company with high uh, investment in training and, and development. So I think there's a number of examples that we can point to where we've used training, the collaboration with employers to actually anchor opportunities for, for young people within their own localities. The development of the, the Regional Skills Investment Plan, which SDS have led on for the Highlands and Islands, which is a different kind of approach there. And importantly, the work and the way that the University of the Highlands and Islands operates with colleges and outreach centres across all of our rural areas so that they are really getting into the community to help support and develop skills and really um, working with the community to understand what their needs are so that they can be supported particularly. I think within the Highlands Island submission as well, we've got uh, the fact that some of the, the, the uh, well-being can be attributed to location in terms of it's very nice to live within rural areas sometimes. Uh, and that could impact on a, a person's well-being. Uh, in, in, with, with regard to that, uh, we still need to focus on the, a, a person to have a, a living wage and a good, uh, good conditions within employment. I mean, as I say, rural Scotland is a wonderful place to live, but we still need people to earn uh, a decent wage. Um, and I wonder if, if anyone was surprised at the Aberdeenshire submission saying that maybe there was a suggestion that too much emphasis was going towards the young people, maybe to the detriment of others. I wonder if anyone, maybe... For I'll, the, I'll, I'll, yeah, go on. I'll pick up uh, Dennis. I haven't, to be honest, hands up here, I haven't read every submission. Uh, but from the Aberdeen one... Uh, Aberdeenshire, apologies. Uh, 
I think there is. Statistically, I think uh, those above the age of 19 in terms of uh, unemployment, we recently published the uh, participation measures, which is a step on from the school leave or destination uh, records. And I think uh, even there, I think we see a disparity with 19-year-olds, so a heavy focus in 16 to 18-year-olds. But I think anecdotally, and I would need to come back with statistics, uh, those that are slightly yeah. older, there's, there's yeah. the, you know, the kind of, not say full weight, but a lot of support from the public sector has swung yeah. round to address youth unemployment, yeah. probably to the detriment of those but if, that are But if older. we look at positive destination, yeah, how, how are we um, managing to, uh, I suppose, um, meet some of the challenges that we've been trying for many, many, many years? Uh, regarding uh, gender equality and people with disabilities because the positive outcomes in terms of the availability of apprenticeships or, or opportunity for uh, women to go into uh, maybe better paid jobs or um, uh, the opportunity um, for people with disabilities, it just doesn't seem to be working yet, does it? Yeah, I, I wouldn't steal some of my colleagues' thunder. Uh, there are appearing tomorrow in front of the uh, committee to, to update on an equal opportunities were finalising a significant piece of work which has came in response uh, to developing Scotland's young workforce, uh, working with uh, organisations from black and ethnic minority groups, BEMIS and, and others, have commissioned significant pieces of work through Equate and investing in uh, projects through uh, the Institute of, of Physics. So. Uh, the, the, the work is uh, probably nearing finalisation and it probably might be an opportunity for colleagues to come back and present to the committee either in this type of format or in a kind of private session just around that, that work and some of the outcomes and future programmes that we'll be delivering. Okay. Okay. Well, if anyone else wants to... Jane. Yeah. I suppose just, just one, one thing for, for me to add. I, I, I was at a, a session the other week where um, uh, six local authorities outlaid to Scottish Enterprise and other partners um, the work that they were doing around the, the kind of Edinburgh City and East region deal. And what they had done was with this idea about productivity, they, they, you know, the whole essence was about how they ensure that all six local authorities um, across that side of Scotland can benefit from the proximity to Edinburgh. Um, they've mapped, um, you know, kind of areas of deprivation, travel to work, things like the transport system, all that kind of thing. And that's, they're the kind of main objectives behind the deal that they've, that they've put a bid for. But I was just really encouraged, it's not Scottish Enterprise that initiated it, by ju but just by that way of thinking, a much more broader regional piece, uh, looking at it, but with a very kind of clear outcomes around productivity and ensuring that all parts of that region are going to benefit from the proximity to Edinburgh. So that, again, starting to grow uh, quite a lot of traction in lots of different areas, which I think is quite is, is quite interesting. I didn't say the Aberdeen regional deal are probably very on a similar vein. Okay. Right. Right. Um, Thank you. Good morning. I wonder if I may uh, firstly just talk to Katrina, Katrina, Katrina uh, from North Ayrshire, uh, and uh, for whom I have a lot of respect in terms of the efforts that are going into economic development. Uh, and uh, Karen and Willie and the meetings I've had with them have outlined future plans. But the role of Slade is, is important, but we only received four submissions in terms of our request for consultation. Uh, now, in these, Dumfries and Galloway uh, and, and uh, North Ayrshire, and Joe and I, of course, share an interest, and we had a conversation with, with Jane about uh, investment of the enterprise agencies in the south of Scotland. But Dumfries and Galloway Council and North Ayrshire Council have called on the Scottish Government to take a more sectoral and geographic approach to job quality. What do you... What do you think Slade means by that? For example, uh, without declaring my overall colours, I don't understand why, for example, in Ayrshire, we have three economic development agencies which might end up overlapping with each other in terms of inward investment, uh, sectoral approach. So what does Slade mean by a sectoral and geographic approach? 
I think there is some acceptance that the issues around fair work um, are particularly prevalent in some sectors more than others. Um, and rather than um, a, a sort of a blanket approach across all businesses in terms of targeting uh, resources where we want to see change, um, I think that's that's probably what that's driving at. Um, on a sectoral level, it's probably sectors such as the care sector, the hospitality sector. You know, the, these are sectors which we support in terms of putting uh, unemployed people into jobs, and we are familiar with the terms and conditions uh, that are offered. And, and we, you know, we feel that that targeted approach of working with that sector, trying to understand how you can uh, get a better progression within that sector and how you can get better growth, in which. You know, if I look at Ayrshire in total, I mean, it's not a huge region, uh, you know, and it's easy to contact. In terms of trying to achieve consistency of approach, uh, in terms of getting fair work and job quality, there isn't any consistency, is there? I mean, you're doing, I know the progression that you're making mm -hmm. in, in East Ayrshire uh, and to some extent South Ayrshire, but not, you know, at different levels. And I don't know what cohesion there is uh, in terms of, Geographic in exchange with fair work, and you know, we just say there's no conditionality. Why not? Uh, well, I, I suppose the geographic um, comment might uh, be related to government policy um, and how that impacts on those those geographies. Um, and just come back to the point earlier around uh, the, you know, the city regions and the, the growth that is anticipated to come through those city regions. Not all areas within Scotland fall within a city region. And you, know, you, you might well ask, how would a young person from Ayrshire access the job opportunities that may be created in Glasgow, um, if that's where the, the growth and the quality jobs are to be on either an apprenticeship rate or on a national minimum wage rate? So it's those those targeted approaches that, we, that probably we would like to see uh, addressed in some way. I think the economic structure in Ayrshire is slightly different from Glasgow, but however, I, I do recognise the work that you're doing. May I ask Gordon and, 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 and Jane a question about one of the big issues that we've had is, is with discuss, discussion of the impact of management. That, you know, we said higher, higher productivity uh, can be linked to employment relations uh, and to increase productivity, I'm sorry for, well, I'm not sorry for uh, relating to productivity again, but it's true that we have poor management. Uh, and I've been guilty, like other directors, of uh, promoting the best sales manager uh, so that he or she becomes the sales director. They were great in the sales job, but dreadful in the sales director's job. So, uh, and I know Scottish Enterprise and the Highlands and Islands Enterprise are doing a lot of work in terms of providing leadership programs some people believe that leaders are born and managers are made. So I wonder if you can comment about, particularly Gordon, what are you doing across the skills uh, spectrum to train managers? Uh, in terms of managers, and there is a bit of, of overlap in terms of uh, the space we occupy with the Scottish Enterprise, we would tend, and Highlands and Islands. Tend to work in a kind of account team structure in, in some of these these areas. So when Skills Development Scotland was formed and come uh, away from Scottish Enterprise, there was not a huge amount of resource identified in, in that area, and it's something that we've sought to build up over the over the course of the, the last seven or so years. So in areas like flexible training opportunities, we've tried to make that as easy as possible for, for companies to access uh, in terms of support. The work that we've done in the sectors, I think, has identified issues around uh, management and supervisory development. I think uh, quite often we look at either the leadership element or the management element and forget about the supervisory uh, nature of, of, of work, because that's quite often the stuff that makes some of the biggest impact in terms of changes and improvements in, in the productivity. So we're working with industry leadership groups and the sectoral uh, trade bodies in terms of actually supporting and encouraging that. And I think that's reflected, I think, in nearly all, if not all, of our skill investment plans, the need to invest uh, not just in staff at the top end, but across the, the spectrum in terms of encouraging good workplace 
practice and workforce planning in terms of uh, continuity of, of business as well. So I couldn't off the top of my head give you a specific figure as to how much we would spend yeah. in management. Yeah, that's just interesting, yeah. you, you talk about leadership again, which is different from yeah. uh, management. And I wonder how much it inhibits people when they say go on a leadership programme and they go, but if you say go on a management programme, that's different. So is there, is there a problem that, that we're calling people leaders who are not effectively leaders, but can manage groups of people? That, that, I think that's, it's actually quite a fair challenge and something that we've been wrestling with. Um, you're, you're right that as an organisation we've invested over the past few years in, in leadership development. I think we had something like a thousand uh, company leaders that we supported in companies of all sizes in, in the past year. But you know, we've started to talk much more now about organisational development in order to tackle exactly that perception that you've talked about. And we're also uh, working at the moment with our colleagues in Highlands and Islands Enterprise and Skills Development Scotland on a new kind of workplace innovation service. So trying to actually get that kind of whole broader message about management practice, employability practices, why that's good for business, why it's good for the economy. So there's work underway to actually just try to counter you know, exactly that challenge that you talked about. I want to have one, one last question, I'm probably address it to Charlotte, although anybody else can answer it. We, rightly or, <clears throat> rightly or wrongly, are obsessed with the minimum wage and the living wage, but those that want to see a very high wage, high productivity economy, we look at some of the investment, the cap capital investment, particularly manufacturing, where it's easier to employ because of the living wage, or we're still the minimum wage, it's easier to employ X number of people because to invest in equipment, the, the depreciation and finance costs uh, are greater than employing these, these people. Uh, and in that case, the, the, you know, for the growth of the economy and the growth of wages uh, and income, and I did mention earlier, uh, the equity participation and income participation. I mean, have you found that there's an inhibition on capital investment in the Highlands and Islands uh, because of that? I think you have summarised the productivity challenge for um, Highlands and Islands and Scotland in that at the moment we are seeing um, that uh, investment has not taken place at the pace that we would like, perhaps in technology and innovation, which would actually achieve those sorts of outcomes that you're talking about. So we are really targeting um, businesses on uh, innovation, technology, that kind of uh, support, which is really going to drive productivity. And also from uh, the evidence that we have and companies that have done that does drive up wage rates as well. I guess there is a specific challenge for companies in the Highlands and Islands, which um, are small or micro businesses. We have some notable exceptions, which are uh, significant uh, multinational companies, and they help us take a leadership role across the Highlands and Islands. So uh, we are looking at being innovative ourselves, as I suppose, and what's a creative way of helping a small business that might employ less than five people to actually address the productivity challenge overall. This, that lack of investment is denying us more rapid growth and mm. therefore more income growth uh, for, for employees. It's definitely a challenge and seeing that kind of investment, as I say, in, uh, in capital, in machinery, in tooling, in innovation, technology will uh, help and drive job, that change. And job quality. And job quality as a result of that. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Okay. Richard, I want to come in and think on local development. Yeah, um, can I, can I say I've known Katrina uh, Catriona, actually, my colleague, uh, from previously North Lancashire Council and your commitment to local authorities. Can I ask you, um, is there a role, a role for local authorities in promoting fair work? Uh, is there a greater role for them to promote fair work? And uh, just to, so I, I don't go on too much, could there be more local authority engagement with the DWP, SDS and enterprise agencies? agencies in order to promote fair work? I would say yes, there is a role for local government in promoting fair work, uh, both in its work with small businesses and particularly in its support of employability. Um, obviously, we, do, we deliver based on what we agree with government um, and what government very often funds us to deliver. So in terms of some of that funding and some of those policies, uh, we are a partner with government in, in delivering on that. So I, I think we, 
uh, have a lot of resources on the ground out working and in companies and we are best placed some, sometimes to engage with those businesses and small and local businesses and to understand some of those issues and I would say Slade is, is very keen and local authorities are very keen to, to work with government on this agenda and are broadly supportive of you know the ambitions and the aspirations uh, associated with it. Thank you. Please, yeah. Please. I have an example, actually, that we um, teased out in preparation for this conversation, and it's uh, um, the local authorities in Borders, Middle Lothian and West Lothian cluster. Um, West Lothian, in particular, have been looking at the quality of jobs and salaries offered, um, and have engaged with DWP, and we've engaged with them. So we've got employer engagement people out on the ground, and one of the things that we're looking at is around the promotion of the living wage to employers. So I think there is more that we can do. It's a good example. It's grassroots example. It's not anything I've asked people to do, which is always the best. The best is when people find their partnerships, understand what's right for the local environment, and also work with their partners to improve it. So I think that is a good example that we can build upon. So it's something that you might want to um, have some further information on from West Lothian. OK, I think we want to um, look some more at some of the DWP issues, so I'll bring in um, Joanne Lund. Thanks very much. Yes, um, as I said earlier, I'm interested in um, situations where it would appear, on one hand, the statement has been fair, in favour of fair work, but that government-funded agencies create potential for people to be exploited in jobs where they're, they're exploited. And I think um, you will probably be aware of the evidence from CAS which says it's losing claimants the sanctions regime to become fearful of declining job offers or leaving jobs even if they're inappropriate, exploitative or they're unfairly treated for fear of being left without income due to a sanction. So what I want to reflect on with you is not the question of sanctions just now. I think there is a very strong debate on the merits of the sanction regime at all. However, if you are applying a sanction to somebody, what checks do you make on the quality and work that people are, are having to take? The only time that we'd apply a sanction concerning actively seeking employment or availability um, is about somebody's indication about um, applying for jobs that are on the, in the labour market. So it's more about um, are they doing all of the activity that is going to make them a successful job seeker. Concerning refusal of employment, there's very low numbers that we actually even refer for refusing employment. I mean, I haven't got the figures with me. Um, I can tease those out for you and send them into the, um, uh, into the committee. Um, but it's, it's extremely small, extremely small. I mean, we're talking about penny numbers. So evidence that I have, um, some that I've met directly with, who describes, for fear of sanction, accepting a job uh, working in a hotel, was told that she would have 16 hours or 15 hours, whatever it would be. When she arrived at the hotel, was told it was piecework, cleaning by room, and she wasn't going to be able to make enough money to pay her bus fee. Would that be acceptable, and what would the DWP do to that employer? I mean, I think the first thing is that if somebody has been... Um, if an advert is, is put onto a job, uh, universal job match, or actually some of the jobs are on other, um, other websites uh, that people apply for, and it doesn't uh, meet the conditions that are already published, then somebody needs to come and talk to us. Now, we haven't got any power over those employers, but you know what we can do is understand why the description of the job was different from the what the individual experienced. Under those circumstances, then, would that person be sanctioned for refusing to do that job? Uh, well, no, because they've already started the job. What they need to do is come and talk to us about the inappropriateness of the job if they feel it is inappropriate. It's about a relationship between the customer and the work coach. But in the context of sanctions, it's very difficult to see how that conversation would take place. So that's one thing. You wouldn't expect that anybody be, to be in that position. The other thing I've been told is that, in a sense, we're talking about rewarding employers for bad practice. That there are companies which recognise they will have a throughput of people who are um, in fear of sanctions and relying on benefits. They go, treat very badly, they come out, but the employer well, they'll know there's going to be another batch coming along thereafter. So do you do any work in relation to how long people are able to stay in work? Um, I'm not... Well, firstly, I, I've not had that quoted to me ever 
in the 10, 15 years I've been in the employment space, whether that's in England or in Scotland. So that's, that's interesting, but I haven't got any examples of that. Um, would we do any work... Sorry, Jan, can you just say that second part again? Would we do any work to... Well, if there was evidence coming to you within particular yeah. local communities where there's a lot of poverty, where people are under pressure to work, that actually the only work that's been made available is poor quality work, but there is also evidence that even when people go through that process, they're not retained or whatever, the, the confidence of the employer is they know there's another load of people who will be coming along from the job centre who will pick up that work even if it's very short term. And if we're talking about high wastage <coughs> employers, you know, we know um, uh, uh, contact centres historically, less so now, have high, had high turnover rates. Um, but actually, contact centres, for example, also have very good progression for those people that want to actually stay and, and be given um, uh, an opportunity to progress in employment. If we're talking about high turnover employment, then we can't affect that. That's a matter of, I suppose, we're back to the quality of the work. But we don't do anything about that, no. We could affect it by not advertising these jobs and encouraging people to apply for them. But the content of the job is, is perfectly appropriate for the individual. Um, you so know. you wouldn't ask any questions why, if there were evidence that people didn't ever last in employment in that particular job. It might suggest it wasn't the individual. It might be about the context in which they're... You wouldn't ask that question. It, I think there's an acceptance that some sectors are high turnover. Okay. Um, Gordon Weddell, I think you were keen to come in. Yeah, I, I was just wanting to ask you um, what the DWP's view is about the evidence we received from the Social and Public Health Unit and the Scottish Collaboration for Public Health Research that stated that some employment is more harmful to individuals than unemployment. Uh, and certainly they said in their evidence uh, that they submitted that studies from Australia provide some evidence that moving from unemployment into a low-quality job measured by job strain, job insecurity and ability to get another job can be worse for mental health than remaining unemployed. You've got a DWP person that's operational, so they are policy questions, yeah, yeah, that you're posing me. I mean, the only thing that that I know is from an operational perspective, trying to support people into employment rather than leaving them out of employment is absolutely the right thing to do. Now, how we go about that and how we are equitable and careful about how we do that is an important issue for me. So um, I, I can't. I don't think it's as black and white as that. You know, and also I haven't got the examples that says in Scotland that I can say that moving somebody through um, an, a, a process where we engage them with a route way into work and also then go into work. I've got examples of people then walking away from that work from a health inequalities perspective where they believe they're worse off. So I, I, I just can't answer the question that you want me to ask, answer really. Would there be any type of employment that claimants wouldn't be encouraged to take? Well, we wouldn't expect somebody um, who is so far away from the labour market to actually enter into employment without the relevant support. So it's about the individual, so it's not about the specific job. It's about saying, what does the individual need? What is their aspirations? How do we get them into the right place to access the jobs that are in the sector or in the locality? The difference that happens, I think, is sometimes the sectors that people want to go into aren't available. So, you know, concerning um, graduates, for example, we've got, I think, about 54% of graduates now who've got, uh, who are, um, are coming out who can't access perhaps uh, the jobs that they would choose to and they're coming into the locality and therefore we present them with probably lower, jo lower qualification jobs than they would really want. Um, but that's the labour market. And I just want to ask what you felt about zero-hour contracts. I mean, a lot of... Um stress that people have to put up with is, is, is about re revolving around financial uncertainty and people that are given zero hour contracts um, you know don't have that financial certainty and I, I just was wondering what your view was on encouraging people to take up zero hour contracts. 
I mean, what we try and do, I'll answer it in a slightly different way. I, I think we recognise that some people, zero-hour contracts is, is what they want, but it's not everybody. But what we do do is work with the employers and the individuals to try and put a bit more certainty into that. But the market drives some of this. So in Edinburgh, for example, um, they've been working with Business Gateway to ensure that... Um, that has been working with some people around zero contract, particularly in the care sector, and they've been able to, to change the employer's um, conditions. But it's in partnership through the business gateways and making sure that the market um, enables us to get our foot in the door about changing some of that. Concerning zero hour contracts and, the, and other areas, <coughs> it's more about exclusivity contracts I mean, the, the legislation changed in May, and I think that was a really good thing. So enabling people to access work, enabling them to have an opportunity to put a number of jobs together if necessary, is better than being unemployed. In universal credit, this is going to really help us. Universal credit is going to be much more flexible so that it's a top-up process. We haven't got the problem where people might go into work one week and they find themselves in a position of having to reapply the following week. What universal credit will do is flex. So somebody will make a claim, and if their contract hours or their contract itself changes, then universal credit will flex alongside that. So it takes the risk away from them about re-entering, uh, uh, reapplying for benefit, waiting for benefit, or actually trying to find another job uh, while they're tr trying to actually manage their benefit claims. Somebody thought that a zero-hour contract w wasn't appropriate for them, given their circumstances. Would they be sanctioned for not taking up a job that was a zero-hour contract post? I think if the zero-hour contract was um, appropriate in the form of the work rather than the hours, then um, yes, I think they would be. Can I just ask a, a follow-up? So it seems we've raised zero-hour contracts. Going back to what we said about the business pledge, the business pledge says that employers should not use exploitative zero hours contracts. What, what's, what's the definition of an exploitative zero hours contract? So this is the exclus exclusivity clause in my head. Right. So before May, what employers could do was actually say, you're on my contract and you can't go and, and supplement your work through another means. You've got to stay with me, you can't go to another employer. Now that's been taken away, that was absolutely not. Um, appropriate. Maybe I could put the same question to, to Jane Martin. I mean, what's, what's Scottish Enterprise's view on what is an exploitative zero hours contract? Um, we, we actually haven't formed a, formed a view on that. What's been quite interesting with the companies that we've been engaging with is this area of not deploying um, zero hours contracts is, is actually one of the easier things that the companies they're working with are, are happy to oblige. So it, it, it's interesting. Obviously, for sectors like tourism that becomes and, and seasonal work, that becomes more, more challenging. Um, but it's actually not been something that's been an issue that's been raised with the account-managed companies that we've been dealing with. It's actually been one of the aspects of the pledge that they found um, easier to, uh, to deliver on. I mean, I this is quite an interesting area because I mean I think if, if even amongst the, the committee members I suspect there, there would be a difference of view. Some people would take the view that all zero hours contracts are bad. Other people would say no, they have a place um, as long as they're not exploitative. But I think it's interesting that the, the business pledge is very explicit that to sign up to it you have to commit not to use an exploitative zero hours contract. And yet you're telling me from the point of view of the government agency that you don't know what an exploitative zero hours contract is. So if you don't know what it is, how is a company signing this pledge supposed to know what it is? I, I, think, <laughs> I think that's a fair challenge. I suppose what I am also saying is that the companies that we are engaging with are happy to just not deploy zero hours contracts. You know, so it, that, it's not really been something, certainly with the discussions we've had to date, and albeit this that depends from certain sectors, seasonal work, that kind of thing. Um, it, it's, not been, it's not been a major issue with the account match companies that we've been having the discussions with, is what I'm saying. I, I guess there may be some very specific examples in, in relation to particularly seasonality. So an example I would give would be um, Scottish skiing in the winter, where it is actually really difficult for the Scottish ski centres not to be um, at the mercy of the weather. Therefore, they do use hours in that way. Okay, okay. A number of members want to come in. I'll, I'll, I'll go back to Gordon first thing. It was his line of question. 
about zero hour contracts. I mean, you, you stated that some individuals it would suit um, to take a zero hour contract, and presumably we're talking about students or or people that are maybe looking for a second job to supplement their income. But that's by choice, and what you're saying by um, you know possible sanctioning somebody who doesn't accept a zero hour contract is they have no choice in the matter where people like students or say nurses that are in full time employment that work bank nursing it's their choice to accept a zero hour contract and what you're saying is that our, our, our emphasis is, is um, reducing the unemployment figures and you will have no choice you will be put into a zero hour contract and you will have to deal with that financial uncertainty All right, that's on the universal credit yeah. So, because Universal Credit does flex, there is, an, there is a, a, I assume, a policy belief that zero-hour contracts then aren't punitive in any way, because somebody can take a zero-hour contract and they will be complemented by the Universal Credit going up and down instantaneously. Under existing benefits, then we wouldn't. Right. But on, on Universal Credit situation, are you saying that that if one person's hours change from, say, 30 hours one week to 10 hours the next, that instantaneously their benefit will change? Because that doesn't happen with housing benefit. You know, people constantly yeah, have to reapply. Yeah. This is because um, what happens is employers have signed up to... Um, I'm, I'm going to get my... I've got an acronym, and I'm trying to remember what it means. It's an RTI system. So it's basically a system that the employer signs in on to... Um, HMRC, it's the download of all their employers' uh, wages. It then flicks across and is used by the IT in, um, in DWP. So that's how it works. And because Universal Credit isn't paid a month in arrears, it's, it's, so, so that's how it works. There's that month's time to catch up with those fluctuations. Uh, yeah, just following up again, I think you said in response to Joanne Lamont that there were very few cases, penny numbers of cases, where a claimant had been uh, had lost benefits because they'd refused work. Um, are there cases where a company, ha where you've declined to advertise uh, jobs because a company has failed to reach uh, appropriate standards? And, and could you give us some examples of how that might happen? And um, if there's a complaint, there's a complaint process into DWP nationally. So if an employee or another employer um, thinks that there is something wrong with an advert that we put on, um, we can't you know, control the whole of the labour market, there is an absolute complaints process where that's investigated. Now, again, I haven't got any figures in respect to that. That's done nationally. And I'm not even sure they would have anything on Scotland figures. It would be a national, national set of figures that they would have. Cases and there are employers who are effectively blocked from access to the. Oh, oh yeah, to, absolutely. To, to, to I, I, I mean, I don't know what the volumes are compared to the volumes that are actually advertised, but yes, there are. That's that's helpful. I wonder if I could ask Gordon McGuinness from Skills Development Scotland a similar question. Clearly, your role is to promote access to apprenticeships and to training programmes. Not all employers seeking that access uh, will presumably meet the kind of standards that we have been discussing. Today, what, uh, do you have examples, are there cases where you decline to accept uh, such uh, employers or such posts into your systems? <coughs> Not to get into our kind of contractual relationships with our training providers, but there's kind of clear guidelines to our training organisations that would contract with employers in terms of what's acceptable. I touched on some of those earlier on in terms of uh, it's got to be a full-time job, uh, conditions around the, the, the rate of pay, we tend to find particularly uh, young people, so th th there's a kind of policing role there in terms of the training provider and how they will assess for things like health and safety within the, the, the workplace, uh, the level of induction a young person would get and the type of kit they will require in terms of their, their kind of working relationship. So it's a contractual relationship we have with our training providers that would set a kind of quality threshold for, for that type of assessment. So, so, so the, the, the interface with the company is by the training provider rather than directly by yourself, but it's con the conditions for it are, are agreed by, by or set by you uh, in contractual relationships with the training provider. And in, in doing that, are there guidelines to quality that you provide to your training providers 
that might be of interest to this committee in terms of our inquiry? There's a, I think, a kind of programme, and we've, we've moved from previously with a kind of Scottish quality management system, which ran across, particularly for colleges, there was a uh, kind of multiple standards that the, the, it was really to stop things like colleges having a different person in inspecting activity every every week. So with agreements with SQA and others. I would need to come back in the detail of the kind of quality framework that we've got just now, so it's not to mis mislead you, but I can come back and share that level of info information. For, for ourselves, in terms of supporting young people, there, there is kind of quality threshold. So our weight of funding is actually based on an output the young people achieving the qualification, which requires a degree of support, obviously, from the employer. So it doesn't actually make any great business sense for a training provider to be working with an employer that doesn't have good terms and conditions and a young person might not actually stick with or achieve their qualification. And I think where there would be an employer, where there was a turnover of young people, then it would be a kind of clear message that there would be something wrong and it would be investigated further. Well, there is a quality threshold in, in, in yeah. that and, and both yourselves and DWP would investigate where there were concerns. For, for, for ourselves, uh, yes, we would, uh, and issues around health and safety are, are kind of paramount. We've got slightly different dif different roles. I think in terms of some of the activities for the future, there's a, currently a consultation document out just now in terms of the future and devolution of the work programme and work choices to, to Scotland. And I think that's open just now through until 8th of October, if memory serves me right. And I think that's a, an important step uh, for us to look at the support for individuals and how that can be uh, aligned to support from local authorities in particular, whether it's uh, social work support, whether it's around housing. So I think there's an opportunity there for us to be kind of more creative in terms of how that support back to work is, is, is structured. If I can paraphrase Denise Horsfall's re re reply and, and check that I've got this right, you will investigate um, in certain circumstances, but what you're looking into is not set against a quality threshold in perhaps the way SDS have described, it's simply misleading, uh, misleading content. Yes. yes. Thanks very much. Okay, thank you. Um, now, I'm quite a list of members who want to come in with supplementary, so can I ask them all to be fairly brief? Start with Patrick Harvey. Thank you. It was just one very specific point that I didn't want to, to, to let slip when we were discussing the meaning of the pledge not using exploitative zero hours contracts. I appreciate that we're still at a point of working toward a, a clear definition. But Denise Horsfall seemed to imply that from her point of view, that simply means the exclusivity issue, which is being banned. Could I just check from Jane Martin's point of view, from the context of the Scottish Business Pledge, it would be meaningless to ask politely if employers would pledge not to do something which has been banned already. So from the point of view of the Scottish Business Pledge, whatever definition we arrive at has to mean something significantly different than simply that exclusivity issue. It has to mean more than that. Yes, yes, absolutely. Um, and if, if we arrive at a clear definition, then of course that, that we, would, we would implement that policy. The way the business pledge currently works is it's got the living wage as a, as a fundamental principle. And then obviously a, a number of different themes and businesses need to sign up to another two with a commitment to working through all of them. And what I'd said earlier was what's quite interesting for me is actually not committing to zero wage, um, zero hours contracts is actually one of the, the most popular, if you like, things that the businesses we were are happy to sign up with. So I, I was just making that That just point. implies we're not yet engaging the pledge with the kind of employers that do use these contracts. Yeah. But it, it's going to have to mean something more than that, that legal minimum. Okay. Thank you. Uh, John McCall. Thanks very much. Uh, well, the questioning is obviously uh, understandably focused on the employers that you engage with. Um, when people are desperate because they've been sanctioned, they don't have any benefits, they will go wherever they can in order to uh, eat, in order to get an income. And certainly some of the evidence that I've gathered in the Welfare Reform Committee, um, it was actually in Glasgow amongst people who had no benefits at all. They were um, you know, working in what was called the black economy. Um, for things like two pounds an hour and car washes and stuff like that, and clearly this is, I would imagine, um, it, it's it's getting a boost from the number of people in sanctions who are willing to take any work at all. So basically, I'm asking you what 
uh, I know that you're not responsible for enforcement, um, but what um, is your understanding, and perhaps the local authority lady could under ask, answer this as well, what's your understanding of the enforcement regime on ex exploitative employers? You know, is it, is it adequate? I mean, I understand that the UK government's consulting on a new director of labour market enforcement and exploitation, but that's not in place yet. HMRC has a role. But uh, clearly, you know, if people are working for two pounds an hour, as I've been told they are, um, that has an effect on the whole uh, economy and, and the other jobs and responsible employers as well. And I w just wondered if you thought that the enforcement was adequate in order to deal with this. I haven't got any information in respect of it. I do think it's a question from HRC. Uh, I, I haven't anything to uh, add to that. Um, it's not something that we are aware of in terms of you know the specific examples that you have raised. Um, but it, you know, it obviously could be a trend, and it is something that we probably should start to. We have we op, all local authorities have a trading standards operation, um, and it is maybe the type of thing through our trading standards services that we should uh, start to you know get our feelers out. For example, with the Gang Masters Licensing Authority, it <coughs> also has a role. No. Yeah, I'm so p perhaps like on the ground in Scotland, yeah. operationally, that that possibly we d just don't actually have the mechanisms here in order to, if somebody knows this is going on, who do they report it to, for example? Mm -hmm. I, I will take it back, back that conversation to my local authority colleagues and, right. and, okay, and thanks very much. give some thought to that. Thank you. Um, Dennis Robertson. Uh, thank you, Convener. Uh, maybe it's uh, to DWP in the first instance, but perhaps uh, others might want to um, uh, answer the question too. It's with regard to transport. Um, do you take into consideration the availability of transport for people to get to um, a workplace uh, or indeed to uh, visit uh, job centres? Because there's people within the sort of rural and remote areas that just don't have the availability of transport or the infrastructure is not there to enable them to get to perhaps a job that is being offered to them because they've got the skill and ability, but no means of transport to get there. What, what do you do in that instance? Yeah, so so the, the legislation, if you like, the guidance, um, says that it should take 90 minutes by public transport to come into a job centre and 90 minutes to um, get to a job. So, um, yes, we do. We've actually got uh, uh, maps up in the job centre that shows the travel to work areas, but also we work through what the, um, each of the offices work through what the travel arrangements are. We work, work with um, a variety of people, both at a local and a national level. Um, we've um, got a, 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 an agreement with Scott Rowell, um, at the moment where they provide us with um, subsidised tickets for unemployed people to either go to job interviews or actually go into a job. So there's lots of work in that area. Um, it's frustrating to my offices and also to me, and it has for many years in England as well as Scotland, um, that we can't influence as much as we would want to local transport arrangements, particularly where we know there's suitable jobs and good jobs. And then sometimes uh, the connectivity between those jobs just doesn't happen. So we do work it with local community partner partnership planning arrangements. We do raise those issues, um, but uh, it's an ongoing challenge, I think. People get sanctioned if they can't get there. I was going to say particularly it is a challenge in the Highlands and Islands and the work we've done uh, earlier this year in terms of rural cost of living demonstrates that people in rural areas actually have to have cars and generally then have to pay more for their fuel from rural petrol stations to be able to travel to work so it is a challenge. Hmm. No but I just wanted to put on record that um, people that don't manage to get to the the job that's being offered will probably get sanctioned because uh, I know you're applying the 90 minute rule. In some cases, some people have to take maybe two, even three buses to get to wherever. They wouldn't be sanctioned. Would they not? Sanctioned. They mm, would not be sanctioned. That's not the evidence we have. In I'd like areas. to see, you know, if I can have that, you yeah. know, if you're individually you've got that, that, those cases, I'd love to see it. I'd love to see it because yeah. it should not happen. Thank you. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, Richard Lund. What would you, I'd like the panel's view on, we have a mandatory minimum, minimum wage, living wage, so why don't, shouldn't we have a mandatory minimum weekly hours 
amount of hours to work and do away with zero hours contracts? What would your view on that be? You know, at the end of the day, and you know, I, I didn't want to get into DWP. You, um, I, I think you've done well this morning in answering some of the questions, even though <laughs> some you. of the people don't, don't like some of the answers. No. Um, but you know, people who are on sixteen hours still get housing benefit, etc., etc., etc. Yes. You know, it's my um, situation where I believe that continually, someone who is getting hours one week and no hours the next week and whatever, you know, have to, whilst you're saying your, your, uh, the new system goes up, flexes, mm -hmm. that's an interesting word, um, but it doesn't, in, in the real world, people get in, get behind with, don't get their benefit, don't get their housing benefit, don't have to take a loan off you, have to pay it back, that's the real world. Mm -hmm. So why don't we have that people get a minimum wage, you know, we spend half our life, or people out there spend half their life filling in forms for you guys to give them benefit, mm -hmm. or go on computers. A lot, not a lot of people have, you know, have access to computers, and that's the real world. So let's solve it by: shouldn't we not have a minimum hours of working that meets your criteria? And let's do away with zero hours contracts. I'd like your views, people. Thank you. <laughs> Can I come in first? Which is, I still come back to universal credit. So, so park the zero hour contracts. The point of universal credit is that it goes a work, gets away from people having to stop and start benefit claims. I do get it. You know, I, I have been in this business a while. I do get the risk that it is for individuals, and universal credit will take that away. It's without a doubt going to be a much better benefit for people. So that's the first thing. So it takes away that risk of stopping and starting benefits. I, I, I personally would love your card, and I'm sure everybody here would like, mm -hmm. in order to send you all the cases that we have of people who are not... You're defending, I have to say, with the greatest respect to you, and, and I've been impressed with what you said this morning, but you're defending the indefensible, and there are people out there. I totally agree with the point that Joanne Lamont made earlier on. There are people out there who are not getting what, what, the, what the time and I'm, I do apologise, Kandina, for going on, but it, that's the real world we're living in and, and I would love your card after this meeting. You can have it, Richard. Thank you. Okay. I, mean, I, think, I think Mr Lyle's but broader question is, is more of a policy question, to be fair. If any member of the panel wants to attempt to answer it, uh, but don't, well, well, uh, Katrina, the colleague, please try. <laughs> um, from a local authority perspective, you know, we, we do apply certain criteria when we support people into work. And uh, whilst it's not a uniform across local, uh, all 32 local authorities, I would say there's a general acceptance that uh, if we are providing any financial support to an employer taking somebody on, we would ask that it's a genuine new opportunity uh, in the job, that it's not displacing anybody out of that job. We would ask that uh, they are an employee, and sometimes uh, small businesses do ask that the person be self-employed. We wouldn't support that. They would have to be an employee of the company um, and that there would be a minimum of 16 hours uh, on offer. So w we do apply a level of guarantee. And that's not to say from the other perspective, from employer's perspective, clearly guaranteeing those hours, there are cost implications. Um, and, you know, th those costs... For even local authorities uh, who, who may have banks of, of staff uh, that um, uh, don't have minimum marge contracts, there, there could be a cost implication with introducing something that on a, on a legislative level. But on a, on, a, on a delivery level, we would operate a minimum of 16 hours. Right, thank you. Okay, we're almost at the end of our time. I've got one more question from Chick Brody. Yes, thank you. Yeah. Uh, having listened with interest and, of course, having met well, 80% uh, of the, the panel. I just wonder if you care to comment uh, on the fact that we've heard Gordon mention four programmes, we've talked about organisation. The whole landscape of work accessibility and job quality seems to be very cluttered in terms of who's doing what. Do you agree with that comment? And how would you resolve it? Is, uh, emerging in terms of the, the, the strategic and policy position on this, then uh, 
perhaps that is not as clear as it might be at this point in time. So it would be good to see following your own findings and particularly what the convention are going to come up with, whether there are any things that need to be changed within the, the roles that we all carry out around this table. Uh, I'll come in. Uh, I think there's often a lot of work goes on behind the scenes. So Charlotte's mentioned the kind of Scott Grad programme, the reality is ourselves, universities, Scottish Enterprise, Highlands and Islands are all part of a management group for that for that programme. For our own activities, both the Modern Apprenticeships and Employability Fund, which is a support for uh, people who are unemployed and further away from the labour market. The decision-making process around that procurement is a co-decision-making process with each of the local authorities, local employability partnerships, which again involves community planning partnerships, so there's a, a structure there. And then I also mentioned the consultation document around uh, work programme and work choices, which I think, from my point of view, has always been a kind of frustration that a lot of uh, people in, in the system within the uh, DWP environment there was a policy agenda from, from down south that often sat detached from the kind of social inclusion agenda uh, north of the border, and you didn't get that harmonisation or alignment of services. The work Katrina and others had done in, in the North Lanarkshire in the past was probably closest to that, using our programmes as a kind of core and then bolting on a discretionary support from local authorities. So could it be improved? Things can always always be improved. I think it's better than what it had been and with work programme and whatever shape it, it comes north of the border, working with ourselves and local authorities and government, I think we can uh, we can come up with better products and in conjunction with the DWP because that element of conditionality as my understanding will still rest when people are coming into the labour market. Okay, thank you. From the authority perspective, we would uh, definitely see the challenges of working with two governments and a number of national agencies and how that actually plays out on a local level. So we, we would always argue that a lot of these uh, the delivery and the decisions around this need to be determined and are best delivered at a local level and just you know reflect that uh, partnership approach uh, which local authorities want to have um, so that you know we, we can design services and uh, deliver products that are best suited to what the local labour market and local communities need. Okay, and last question. Please, please, John Lovett. Very briefly, we talked about the extent to which your agencies um, try to encourage good behaviour externally with those that you're, you're working with. To what extent do you think your agencies should be a role model as employers? Um, you may be aware of the PCS, the Civil Service Unions campaign, which obviously, it, you know, pay negotiation is a separate matter, but as part of that, they've produced testimonies about the experience of people of low pay, lack of progression, and so on. Um, in their own workplace, and I wonder what work is done by your agencies to live up to the notion of what fair work is, um, both in terms of fairness to the, those you employ, but also as a, a model for um, employers in business more generally. Point. I think we do. We do as a public agency see that we need to have that role. So, of course, we pay above the living wage. We have. Uh, looked at what we do in terms of supporting youth and um, have been awarded investors in youth people in, in, in youth uh, supporting graduates and graduate placements which we found massively beneficial to the organisation uh, looking at our procurement uh, to make sure that that is living wage compliant as well so I absolutely agree I think we need to be able to practice what we preach. If I can just echo that, I think it is important that we're seen as being exemplars and, and similarly to Helens and Islands Enterprise, you know, we have double tick in terms of our employment practices, we're a living wage accredited employer, we're looking at our procurement practices and ensuring that our suppliers are also um, kind of doing this kind of stuff. We kind of focus a lot on employee engagement, we actually follow the Great Place to Work um, every two years in terms of the Sunday Times to try to benchmark us against not just other public sector partners but the best in the private sector as well. So we're very serious about this and I think it's important we're seen as being exemplars. Uh, I think uh, we received the uh, living wage uh, employer recognition from the living wage coalition earlier in the, the, the year. We've achieved the investors 
and young people standard. Uh, we've got a heavy programme of in, engagement in terms of modern apprenticeships and, and interns. And I think we've got a service through our employer services team which looks to share that practice and support, particularly around apprenticeships with other public sector sector agencies and we've been doing a good piece of work in, in partnership with the National Health Service as well. So I think there's plenty of examples uh, there that we can we can point to and, and share with others. What views do you have relative to reflecting on these testimonials which perhaps tell a slightly different story from yeah, a very individual perspective? Yeah, that, that, absolutely. If there's stuff out there that's, that's relevant to Skills Development Scotland, uh, of course. And it takes us to uh, 12 noon. Uh, can I, on behalf of the committee, thank all the panellists for coming along and contributing this morning. It's been a very useful discussion. Uh, at this point, we will suspend briefly and go into private session. Thank you.